Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Devlin. Um, I have the pleasure of being chair at Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's annual general meeting and annual members meeting, which I'll refer to as the AGM AMM from now on. So due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, we are actually for the second year running holding our AGM AMM virtually rather than in person. And as with much of the country, if, if not across the whole of the world, we had hoped that restrictions would no longer apply. But as I'm sure you're all aware, restrictions for health and care settings remain in order to protect our vulnerable patients and to look after our staff who care for them. So we look forward to being able to celebrate the achievements of the last financial year with you all in person next year. Um, but for today, we'll stick with the virtual approach. So our meeting today is focusing specifically on the 2020-2021 financial year. So up to 31st of March 2021. And as that is a few months ago, there will, of course, have been other changes since that time. Um, but just to keep our focus, we won't be picking those up uh, today. So given the unprecedented times we continue to find ourselves in, and indeed that uh, really affected the whole of this particular year we're looking at, there are going to be numerous references to the impact of the pandemic on the trust, our staff, the Nottingham and Nottinghamshire health and care system, and indeed on those who use our services. Arts, craft and literature have been valuable outlets for many during the difficulties of the last year. And throughout the meeting, we're going to be showcasing some of the creative work that has been happening across the trust by our staff, patients and service users. And we'll also be enjoying a musical performance from a patient at our Wathwood Hospital. All of the documents we're talking about today during the meeting are already available on our website uh, and the slide, uh, the slide here will now show where to find them. So I'll just pause for a moment, see if that's coming up. It may be that that's going to be later in the session actually. Um, so uh, just to say for technical, uh, uh, yes that slide will come up at the end. Um, for technical and social distancing reasons, um, we are unable to provide the usual sign language uh, interpreters live with us today. However, just to assure you that a signed version of the meeting will be made available on our website in just a few days time. And if you are using uh, Microsoft Teams rather than a web browser uh, to, to watch this, you should be able to add captions or subtitles through the settings button. Uh, although uh, I'm, uh, I'm warned that as with several news channels, sometimes the automatic options for the wording that appears uh, isn't always the correct wording, which could be an interesting dynamic uh, in addition. So, this is my second AGM AMM at Nottinghamshire Healthcare as I joined the trust in January 2020. And during my time here, uh, I've already met many staff and volunteers, though not as many in person as I would have liked given the pandemic. And I'm very impressed with the services that they provide on a daily basis. Their compassion and commitment is something I'm truly proud of and particularly so over the past year and a half of the pandemic. For much of the time, it's been impossible to visit in person as many areas as I would have liked. It's been really important that we make sure that we are observing all of the good guidance around our workplaces and also considering additional impact on our staff and services. However, I have been welcomed virtually across many services and that's meant I've had opportunities just to listen to, see, get engaged with staff and those using services. I have to say I've come away impressed many, many times. I also want to put on record my admiration for colleagues who have been carrying out their duties whilst continuing to wear PPE to protect patients and their colleagues. Uh, it really does add uh, an intense layer 
to day to day working uh, and I'm really grateful for you uh, for continuing uh, to observe the PPE requirements, uh, especially during the last week or so of incredible heat as well. So on to today's meeting. There are three key things that we need to do. Um, a couple of them are quite technical. First off, to receive and agree the minutes of last year's AGM AMM, then to receive the annual report and accounts for 2020-2021, then also to celebrate some of the achievements from around the trust from this year as well. So if I could move to our first task, please. Our first task is to consider the minutes of our last AGM AMM and whether they are a true and accurate record of the meeting. And as we're unable to take comments from the public in real time this year, we have agreed, as we did last year, that anyone wishing to comment on the accuracy of the minutes can email our Deputy Director of Corporate Services, Becky Cassidy, with comments. And again, contact details will come up at the end. If required, the board will then re review any comments for formal consideration. So with that caveat, could I invite a proposer uh, to recommend receipt of the minutes, please? I'll just pause for a second. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Benga Shadari here, Deputy Lead Governor. I hereby propose the minutes. Many, many thanks, Benga. I appreciate that. And uh, could I see if we've got somebody to second uh, that proposal, please? Good morning, Chair. It's Carolyn White, non-executive director. I'm very happy to propose, uh, so, sorry, second the minutes as an accurate record from last year. Thank you. Thank you both, in which case we will um, take an approval of those minutes, um, notwithstanding if any members of the public come forward with comments uh, through the route that I've described there. Um, so thank you for that. I'd uh, now like to introduce our lead governor, Jim Aliander, to talk with you about some of the Council of Governors activity that's taken place over the past year. Jim, over to you, please. Thank you, Paul, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jim Aliander, lead governor for the Trust, reporting on the work of the Council of Governors for the year. As, as we've heard, the uh, year was extraordinary uh, for the Council of Governors, uh, as it was for our trust, the NHS and the nation. The COVID-19 pandemic controls, the trust's role in the vaccination programme and the necessity to maintain core services all meant that the engagement of governors was focused on areas where we could be most effective and efficient. I would say actually, and not get in the way of good practice. Uh, in presenting this report, I pay tribute to all the staff of the Trust and the leadership of John Bruin, our Chief Executive, and his team for their exceptional efforts during the year. The Board of Directors advised upon and oversaw the provision of services which were maintained successfully and well in circumstances of, at times, extreme adversity. I was elected as Lead Governor by members of the Council of Governors in June 2020. Throughout the year, I was able to liaise with the chair of the board, Paul Devlin, to ensure our own involvement as governors in representation and review activities. I thank Paul and the administrative team serving trust directors and governors for the way they enabled the council to carry out its responsibilities in the most challenging year the trust has faced. Annual elections to the Council of Governors were held on schedule and 10 of the 12 vacancies were filled and notified in February 2021 with an online induction programme <coughs> provided for new governors. The report that follows uh, lays out the responsibilities of the Council. It references uh, the elections held and activities undertaken by governors, including meetings, both formal and informal. The representation of members required some ingenuity uh, in a year of very tight pandemic controls, but was carried out purposefully as shown in the report. I thank my fellow governors for their commitment to their roles in a demanding year. In particular, governors who were newly elected in 2020 and 2021, as they've had only a partial opportunity to engage with the trust as they would wish. I also thank the public for their huge support for the services provided by NHS Nottinghamshire Healthcare. 
As governors, we have two statutory duties. These are to hold the non-executive directors individually and collectively to account for the performance of the board of directors and to represent the interests of the members of the trust as a whole and the interests of the public. In carrying out these duties in 2020-21, in summary, we participated in the appointment of two non-executive directors in October 2020. We were involved in the appointment of the Director of Community Services in June 2020 and governors took part in the independent well-led review conducted by Grant Thornton, which was also in June 2020. The chair appraisal took place in October 2020 with governors invited to provide their individual feedback in an, an anonymized online form. Governors were also consulted on the development of a new trust strategy in December 2020 and that trust strategy continued in its embryonic form to be developed uh, towards the end of the year in question. The Council of Governors performs its role and responsibilities through general meetings, uh, through monthly accountability and development meetings and through participation in service area visits and observations of the directors and related subcommittees. In 2020-21, the Council held three formal meetings and also three joint board and Council of Governors meetings uh, during the year. There were further question and answer sessions with the Chair and Chief Executive uh, in March 2021. And those question and answer sessions continued. A meet the non-executive directors informal session was held for governors on the 14th of July 2020. And we're now recognising we're, we're a year on from the AGM held under the same pandemic controls last summer, uh, but that was well supported and our formal requirements were met at that meeting, the AGM in 2020. Informal online meetings for governors, uh, drop-in meetings they could be called, uh, were held during the year to enable uh, individual governors to contribute their thoughts uh, on how the council should be operating and, and to support me in my role. And I'm grateful for uh, both the questions and for the sort that took place, the, the uh, support that took place. All ideas presented by governors were taken up with the trust executive uh, and acted upon uh, wherever pandemic control is allowed. The Council of Governors, as I said, has a statutory duty to re represent the views uh, of the membership and the wider public on key issues relating to the trust plans and their implementation. During 2020-21, governors continue to hold the trust to account on those priorities through monthly accountability sessions and in formal council meetings. Governors have had the opportunity to join in focus sessions with the CQC as part of the well-led review and support the Great Place to Work programme, uh, bringing our values and behaviours together. They've also been involved in selecting the Trust's quality indicators and provided commentary on the quality report. Governors will continue to engage with their constituents in the following ways, by attending consultation events, some of which currently are online uh, by uh, attending the trust annual members meeting AGM uh, such as this one by attending council of governors meetings by engaging with members of the two involvement centers and uh, with contact from members of, of the public via the trust website that concludes my report um, for this meeting a more detailed version will be available with the papers for the meeting I'm now pleased to introduce the first of this morning's performances. We have a selection of artwork and poems from staff and patients at the Horizon Day Assessment and Treatment. Hi, my name's Mel Kiley. I'm the team leader at Horizon Day Assessment and Treatment Unit. Two weeks ago, it was um, a learning disability creativity week. Um, so we made lots of we made lots of things, as you can see from the table. We also made bunting. We made a hundred pieces of bunting for Captain Tom's anniversary. Um, all the service users and the staff got involved. Poetry is a really good way to express emotions, um, especially during lockdown. 
We've had a poetry competition among staff and we had 13 entries. I think I wanted to bring out the creativity amongst the staff and all the poems are really excellent. I was really surprised by the quality. So we've created a poetry book um, and we've produced 200 copies um, with the staff poems and there's some illustrations to go along with it. And I'll, uh, I shall read a poem from it and this is by me. When she got closer to Brum, when she got closer to Brum, she began to call herself a mom instead of a mum. Nearing New Street, she felt nearer to her old self, with safer vowels to come out hiding. The coast was clear, although she was nowhere near the coast. She felt empathy for the girl who got teased because of her red hair and dyed it like it was an embarrassing accident. Ian was bitten by a bat. Let's think about that for a moment. Terry works too many twilights, a fact that maybe we should highlight to ensure he's not too tired. But back to the bat that bit Ian. Did it mean to? Did it have rabies, scabies or even babies? Frank is struggling to sleep. Maybe the poet competition will help him reap all the backdated sleep. Reading all the O's, limericks, rhymes and potions could be so boring they will soon have him yawning. Or maybe they will give him a giggle and everyone else too. A flower by name who I picked, one not too bright but my face she licked. I knew from then on you were going to be my friend for life. One day you might get me to see me become someone's wife. Eyes so wide and full of joy, you're always asking me to throw your toy. Tail wagging every time I walk through my door, I could not ask for more. My little companion with tiny paws, you, all, you never abide by any of my laws. I love you so much, but please stop hiding my socks. <laughs> this scary world, locked in a box day and night, watching the world so going out to fight. In our little bubble, that's part of the trouble. It's sending my mind into a muddle. It's for my protection, that's everyone's reaction. The world has become scary and I have become wary. Then after a while, I'm told you're free, go fly your kite. But what about my initial fright? The people, the noises, the lack of space. I'm not sure I can keep up with this new normal pace. My poem is about wine. I love wine. <laughs> wine. There's white, there's red, there's rosy too. Some is sparkling, all but a few. There is sweet, there is dry and fruity, all of which makes me choosy. There is old beers, new beers, ales of plenty, old speckled and which should be drunk before ten, but only by old men. Rums and vodkas, gins of many, scotches and brandies have been known to make you randy. So if I was you, I'd stick to just beer, it leaves your head pretty clear. But for me, it has to be said, my go-to favourite tipple is a rosy red tipple. I think we'll all agree that was a lovely set of poems there with some real variety. Um, good morning, I'm Lorraine Hooper. I am the Trust Director of Finance, Information and Estates. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to take you through our finances for the 2020-21 financial year. I can have the next slide, please. The key headlines for our finances are that the trust has met its financial obligations throughout what we'll all agree is a very has been a very challenging year. Our regulators, NHS England and Improvement, monitor our finances before any form of exceptional items like impairments. And for our finances in this in that year, we delivered a £2.5 million surplus. And our accounts have been reviewed by our external auditors, Mazars and they've been given an unqualified opinion. There's a second aspect to the review of our accounts and our processes, and that's the value for money opinion. 
and in line with national guidance, that work is still continuing. So that means that our annual report and our accounts have not yet been laid before Parliament, but they will be done so before the September deadline, um, just like a lot of other organisations. And when uh, that is done in September, the accounts and annual report will be available for uh, public review. Have the next slide, please. So like many, well, like all aspects of our lives, really, over the last year, our finances were no different and were significantly affected by the pandemic. And we were paid in very different ways to that which we would normally expect. And for the first half of the year, for April to September 2020, our pro uh, providers received top up income on a monthly basis. That meant that every month we considered our costs appropriately reported to those reported those and received income that matched those. For the second half of the year, once regulators and the Department of Health and organisations better understood what finances and expenditure looked like in a pandemic, we were given a nationally determined block and we managed our expenditure within that block. And we did so in a successful way, delivering the £2.5 million surplus. And as you can imagine, there were a significant number of COVID costs in this financial year and are included in that financial position. Things like um, PPE, personal protective equipment and the additional staff that were needed from agency and from bank when we found we needed support as our staff isolated from COVID. If I can have the next slide, please. So over the course of this finance, last financial year, we received a total of £552 million worth of income. As you would expect, most of that income comes for the direct provision of our services. It comes from NHS England for our regional, specialised and national services. And the vast majority of the rest of that service income comes from our local commissioners. Nottingham and Nottinghamshire CCGs and also Bassett Law for the services we provide there. But we also receive income, which you'll see in the other income part of this pie chart, for things like education and training and for research. So the next slide, please. To work us through what we spend this money on. And as I think you would expect, we spend the vast majority of our money, just under £400 million of it, on our staff and on our workforce to deliver our services. We also include, we also spend money on purchasing healthcare from other organisations like our voluntary sector partners um, in elsewhere in our system. Next slide, please. A little bit more on what it um, has meant for us during COVID on our finances. So as you can see there, our COVID-19 expenditure was £16 million. And that, as I've already said, were things like PPE, like additional staffing and the cost that we needed to make sure that our teams could work from home effectively during the pandemic. Together with system partners, we've also set up the vaccination programme for Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. And our share of costs for that as an organisation has been £2 million. Both of those items that total that £18 million have been fully reimbursed to the organisation via some income. And whilst we've been managing through a pandemic, we also have managed to really positively continue to invest in our capital programme. These are for items of significant expenditure like estates and like equipment. Um, that are designed to last for a number of years and support the development of our services. And we managed to spend £40 million last year on these sorts of things. If I can have the next slide, please, I'll take you through a little bit of detail on what we spent that money on. Most significantly, last year, we spent £27 million on the purchase and beginning the alterations at a hospital in Mansfield that's known as Sherwood Oaks. That's to begin the start of our journey on eradicating dormitories in our mental health wards. And there's lots of um, financial support nationally to ensure that programme takes place over the next few years. We've also spent £6 million on the Trust's digital infrastructure, beginning improvements on our virtual private network, which is what our staff use to access working remotely, as well as our Wi-Fi network when we're in our organisations. We also um, spent money on equipment for staff like laptops for working from home and enabling flexible working. 
And last but no means least, we spent the balance of that £40 million on essential backlog maintenance, things like making sure our buildings are safe and are secure and we can deliver high quality services from them. Next slide, please. And just finally, one last area of regulation. We are regulated via, on our finances via what is known as the use of resources score. That works on a sliding scale from one being the, the what regulators will be least worried about up to four where organisations would be in special measures and receiving significant financial support. And this financial year, we've, re we've reported a score of two. And that's largely because of the additional agency spend in place because of supporting um, the need for extra staff during the pandemic. And not to be unexpected. So that's the last of what I uh, wanted to take you through on our finances over the last year. And I'm going to hand over now to the chief executive, John Bruin, who's going to talk us through a review of the year. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, morning, everybody. John Bruin, Chief Executive. Um, be nice to be able to say, lovely to see you all. Um, I can't see anybody um, apart from myself talking at the screen, unfortunately. Hopefully this time next year it'll all be over. Um, so, um, what's the next half hour got in store? I'm going to go through some of the highlights of the year. Um, there's an awful lot of really positive things to talk about. Um, and also include some of um, the brilliant um, awards, winners, uh, shortlisters and finalists that we've had. Um, so listen up for that. Um, to begin, um, thanks Lorraine for that summary of the, of the financial world. Um, looking after um, over half a billion pounds worth of public money is a really important aspect of what we do as an organisation. Um, and it's it's good to see that um, we're essentially in good shape and also that clarity that you bring to the figures um, makes it easy for me to understand. So thank you. Um, everybody will also be pleased to hear, according to the notes that were written for me, that you're not going to be looking at my um, face for the next half hour. We've got some um, pictures um, of art and craft work that's um, across the organisation people have um, been working on and contributing to. So hopefully that's a, um, something nice and visual to, for you to see whilst um, I take you through the next few minutes. Um, the most important thing I, I believe to say at the outset is a huge, huge thank you to everybody that's working in the organisation, to all our staff, and volunteers that have done just a fantastic job over the last year. Um, I'm proud to be chief executive here in Knott's Healthcare um, and the, the professionalism and the resilience, the adaptability and flexibility of all our staff and volunteers has just been remarkable um, because it's been a real test of all our character, hasn't it, over the, over the recent months. Um, so moving on, what have we done um, in the last 12 months? From a, um, a board perspective, obviously whilst managing all the challenges of the pandemic, we've continued to appoint to lots of um, new positions in the executive team and in the board and other senior leadership positions across the trust. It's really important that we've got strong leaders um, across all our different services. Um, to um, support our staff and to develop our services and continue to provide um, safe, effective and well experienced services for all our patients and service users. Um, and I, I'm really pleased with the progress that we've that we've made on that. There's always more to do. Um, there's always um, the drive, isn't there, to, to, to improve and be better and to um, improve the quality of, of our service offer. Um, importantly, um, since I started back here in, at the start of 2019, one of the fundamentally important things is around the culture of the organisation, the environments that we create um, to enable 
um, all the staff across the organization to to be their best and to do what they love to do and to work there um, to their their best abilities and to support them to do that um, and we spent a lot of time working on on creating the right environment so the culture can grow um, organically and that um, that we live and breathe our values uh, and that they were produced um, many will remember from a, um, a very sort of widespread co-produced piece of work um, to sort of reinvigorate the values but to make them more than just five words on a page so that um, it's all very well having values but what what behaviors do they drive what behaviors do we like to see and encourage what behaviors do we need to call out um, and again I'm really pleased with the progress we're making on that there's still a lot more to do um, you know, we're getting we're getting good feedback on the progress, but we also know that that more work needs to be done. And this is something that's a constant. We'll continue to do. It's not a program that's going to end. We can continue to work um, and and drive things to be better for everybody. Because at the end of the day, staff morale is the most important thing. Um, uh, and making Knotts Healthcare a great place to work. Is is the ultimate goal. One of the one of the um, key markers of how we're doing against that is something called the National Staff Survey, which is a um, a national survey of um, regular questions um, to all staff in organisations um, in the NHS. Um, and again, I'm really pleased to say and reflect on that this year we um, made really significant improvements and one of the, we're one of the most improved organisations in the whole country um, and that's a testament to everybody's work and commitment to um, address these fundamental aspects of why we come to work and like I say making the organisation a great place to work um, there's more to do because despite that fantastic improvements it still overall only puts us um, as average if you like um, and I know lots of people um, want to be better than average um, so that's in the year ahead um, to move up the lead table as it were. Um, there are three particular areas of focus from the National Staff Survey and uh, additional um, engagement with um, many staff groups across the organisation where our focus is is continuing to be. That's on um, making sure that the experience of um, our BME colleagues um, is improved and that we continue to have um, zero tolerance of, of racism, discrimination and bullying. Um, um, again, we started some really good work um, here. There's lots more to do, but I'm pleased with the progress we've made. Um, more broadly, the health and well-being of all our staff and volunteers is, is, is always important, but never more so than in the last year. We know that across the NHS and social care that um, staff are, are exhausted, um, they're tired, they're having to work it, probably in different areas and different teams in different circumstances, managing all the testing, managing all the, the, the um, personal protective equipment challenges. Um, and again, I'm really pleased with the, the resource and the people that we, we've been able to put into our staff wellbeing service and that the benefits that will um, already are already accruing from, from that. And the other um, focus of those three key things is um, reducing the violence that's been being experienced by our colleagues. And again, not backing away from some of the harsh reality, if you like, of the figures that um, some of those incidents are, um, well, all of those incidents, um, we need to focus on reducing um, frequency and the um, to squealy of those. And um, I think it, it's also important to restate that when I say, for example, that I want not healthcare to be a great organisation to work for and um, that's to emphasise that we want it to be fully inclusive where everybody 
um, feels valued, everybody feels they've got a part to play, everybody feels that they can make a contribution and at the same time able to speak up um, about any issues um, that they feel are important, good or bad. Um, that again, we've got an environment where um, the psychological safety uh, and people feel able to say, hang on a minute, or this is brilliant. Moving on, I could not um, do a half hour summary without mentioning the Care Quality Commission. Um, our, rate, our overall rating has remained unchanged um, since this time last year, um, largely on account of the fact that the CQC have not been able to do their usual um, inspections. Um, we've had um, a small number of announced and unannounced visits through the year, particularly for areas of concern. Um, we speak to the CQC on a regular basis and um, keep them updated on um, all our progress and all our issues. Um, some of you may know that we are due an inspection anytime soon and um, the executive team and others are putting a lot to work into um, enabling us as an organisation to showcase um, the great work that we do and um, the brilliant services that we provide. Um, the CQC have begun inspecting again. Um, local trusts just down the road have, have had full inspections and, and we're, we expect um, them to turn up anytime soon in the coming weeks. Um, so the, um, there's, a, there's a couple of sort of key messages about that really is and um, from our perspective it's an opportunity to showcase and shine uh, and we shouldn't be um, afraid to step forward and um, speak about the great work that we do and see it much less as an examination to pass it's a part of the journey um, and again I'm, I'm confident that um, we've got some really great stories to, to um, share with the CQC Um, how could I not mention the pandemic in a little bit more detail? Um, as Paul said in his introduction, um, at the AGM last year, we were hoping that um, in a year's time, it would be a dim and distant memory how wrong we were. Um, and, it, and it seems again, doesn't it, that as we all watch the, the, the daily figures on the news and in the media, that um, you know, we're yet again in another um, really difficult wave of the pandemic with case numbers um, rising very quickly. Um, again, uh, important to recognise that the tremendous work that all our staff and volunteers have done to keep the show on the road, as it were. Um, the, um, the, the massive change to how we used our facilities, the, the digital infrastructure that, that we were able to put in place um, almost overnight, really, um, facilities like this that connects people and engages with people. Um, the, the transportation of um, personal protective equipment across the county and um, supporting other organisations and um, just a huge um, endeavour by many, many people that um, kept us going. Um, and again, I personally like to thank every single member of staff that has stepped up to the plate, shown huge resilience and professionalism. Um, to, to keep the trust going and um, to keep our essential services going during the pandemic. I'd like to be able to say, you know, as it fades away, but um, the NHS nationally is again under increasing pressure during this wave. The vaccination programme has, has, has been a, a mitigated success and is, um, is clearly helping um, the severe end of, of the effects of COVID in terms of hospital admissions and such, but um, unfortunately, I still think there's quite some way to go. Um, related to that has been the um, the work that we've been able to do as a system. So increasingly, we're, uh, you'll be hearing the, the, the phrase integrated care system or ICS uh, and related. Um, and the ICS is essentially all the health and care organisations in the county working together. Uh, currently under a sort of a relatively informal umbrella 
that from April next year, will the ICS will become a statutory body. So we're in that sort of funny period of um, uh, grey as those um, arrangements are crystallised and finalised. But the pandemic, if anything, has shone a real bright light on the benefits of working together. Um, and I often use the example of many of our patients and service users um, that use our services, use many other services across um, the county. Um, most people are registered with a GP practice and um, will see practice staff. Um, they might um, need to use community services. They might need to um, get services from social care. Um, they might need to go to the acute hospital, either the emergency department or outpatients for um, comorbid conditions. And it makes sense, doesn't it, that all those um, different uh, that are currently different organisations are better connected so that the the care pathways, so um, the different treatments that people and interventions that people require um, are much more accessible and flow much better together without having to be passed from and referred to and from and put it to post. So um, on paper, it sounds an easy thing to do, um, but this is a very new um, way of um, coordinated services nationally. Um, but the pandemic's shown that we can do it. The, the vaccination programme is, is a particular example of that. We've worked really closely with um, the, the CCG, the Care Commissioning. Um, I can't even remember what CCG stands for, someone will tell me. Um, the Acute Trusts, um, Social Care, Clinical Commissioning Group, I beat myself to it. Um, the acute hospital local authorities to um, make sure that um, the vaccination has been available um, from the very vulnerable older cohorts of our population right through to um, people of 18 and over. There's more to do. There'll be boosters um, come along anytime soon. Um, and the trust has been um, at the forefront leading that programme. And I, again, I'm really pleased of the of the success of it. Um, We've um, within the organisation about 90% of our staff have received both vaccines. Um, just uh, not in the script, but in brackets. And um, those that haven't, you haven't missed it. It's still available, and we will continue to encourage people to take up the uh, the vaccine. Close brackets. Um, so. Now I'd just like to go on to a few more specific things in terms of what, OK, so what have we actually done in the last um, 12 months? And um, don't worry, I'm not going to talk all day, but I could because there's been a massive amount of, of things that we've done. But the following are just a few highlights just to give a sense of the diversity and the breadth of the organisation. Um, so one that um, perhaps not very many people will be aware of, but um, I'm particularly proud of. We sponsored um, a restaurant in, in Nottingham called Bar Iberico um, with um, some money to, um, whilst they were closed, for their chefs to prepare meals for people in Nottingham that were facing a food crisis, including children, young people, the elderly, the vulnerable, the, helm the homeless and NH staff. Um, and they provided over 10,000 meals. Um, in the early part of the pandemic um, and you know for people that otherwise wouldn't have been avail uh, avail themselves of a of a hot meal so I, I think that's a really good example of some of the perhaps behind the scene things that the organization is involved in. Our community respiratory physiotherapy teams were able to quickly develop a virtual pulmonary rehabilitation offer um, for people in, in the county. Um, met national benchmarking criteria. Um, the um, staff and patients on Jade Ward at Rampton Hospital created a rainbow garden um, that promoted a sense of community and inclusivity for all. Um, one of the things that we saw on our Connecting Knots um, monthly session was a, a real tearjerker from um, 
Michelle Snowden, who is a senior paediatric physiotherapist who worked with a, a young 14 year old um, who had quite severe cerebral palsy, who could barely walk um, with her and her team's support. Um, that we saw a, a brief video of him completing an 8.2 kilometer, kilometer run, um, which was quite phenomenal. Um, we've been supporting patient involvement in uh, Leicester Prison, finding new ways to engage with patients using local charity, uh, an arts charity, writing poems, um, showcasing men's creative talents and sharing their personal experiences of the pandemic. Um, one of the things that I had a chance to witness um, before I was um, confined to my office was um, Letters from Friends, um, which was a loneliness initiative at Lings Bar Hospital where um, people were encouraged to write to patients um, on postcards and letters um, and just seeing the huge mailbag and how that um, connected and was so well received by patients at Lings Bar was, um, was um, really incredible and that was something that was um, we did in collaboration with um, Age UK charity. Our family nurse partnership um, is a home visiting parenting program for very young families and vulnerable young mums. Um, this supports over 370 families across the county um, from pregnancy um, and into the, the early months of childhood, which are critically important. I think this is a, a phenomenal service and it's you know, the, probably one of the most important times to, to provide this sort of specialist help um, for both mums and um, for young families. So um, that's a fantastic um, team. Uh, I'll just pause one second and sip. Right, I've got to coordinate now because I'm going to give a telephone number out in a minute for um, just for the record because I'm, I'm just going to mention a couple of things that we've set up um, crisis phone lines. And again, um, we've now been able to have a 24 seven um, crisis line for um, local people that are, are truly at crisis point with their mental health um, and they have 24 seven access to um to support and we've also launched launched a new mental health um line um at start of mental health awareness week and uh, for people that have got concerns um, and i'm sure we'll be able to put this um out again but the, the number for both of those it's a free number which is 0808 196 3779 um, and i had again the opportunity to, to chat with a, a couple of people that were um, staffing those phone lines and um, the talent and skill to be able to do that well it was really impressive and um, they were really um, loving their role um, and it, it's, a, it's a brilliant thing to be able to do. Um, we've got a critical time intervention team set up at uh, Lincoln Prison and this specifically works with individuals um, for when they leave prison. Um, it's a, identified as a real risky time um, getting back into society and um, yeah, well documented that um, it's, it's very easy for, um, for former prisoners to either slip into old ways, but, but also to, for them to access the sort of ongoing services um, that they may well need. So it's really good to see that in place. One of the things particularly close to um, my heart is um, at last being able to say that we've got a new ADHD service um, that we've been able to um, work with um, commissioners on um, to get the funding to, to deliver this. So that's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, the, the demand for that um, in the county has been huge um, and it's really important that we get services that are tailored to meet the needs of this of these people and um, it's not just nothing that's it's been a national issue that's been been grown over recent years so i'm really pleased to be able to uh, announce that and and know that it's now uh, up and running across the county um 
something else that um, the trust is is leading on is something that you might have come across that we call is called impact which is um, a service that we are lead provider for across the east midlands for adult secure care for low secure and um, medium secure forensic services so we're a lead organization for um, of nine providers um, some nhs some independent sector um, that's we are running, leading, coordinating, um, and we're one of the first organisations nationally to run this sort of provider collaborative. So there's lots of interested eyes on us, and it's I think it's a really good example of um, us showing some really strong leadership here. And I know that that people are working on impact are, are really clearly cited on the importance of doing the best for patients and um, for their experience of care and for improving outcomes. And so it's a really important um, service, service to be in. Um, Lorraine's already mentioned um, that we bought a hospital in the year um, over in Mansfield um, that we've called Sherwood Oaks and we're hoping that this will be refurbished. It, it's being converted to from a, um, a closed and um, secure unit into an open unit for, for adults and older adults um, in combination with conversion of services at Millbrook in, um, in Mansfield. It's a, it's a brilliant scheme. Um, it's cost quite a lot of money in terms of capital, but I'm pleased to say the trust has been able to um, fund it. And it will, um, as Lorraine says, eradicate dormitories. So we don't want people um, who need to come into hospital to um, be in rooms of four or six others behind curtains. It's so important that we get the dignity and the experience for in patients' right. Um, and um, with the purchase of Sherwood Oaks, we're well on the way to that um, being realised. So uh, a really important part of our future um, in patient services and really looking forward to, to those getting to be up and running. Topical, um, I'm just going to talk briefly about eating disorders. On the national radio this morning, there was an article on the importance of early intervention um, for people with eating disorders. Um, and please say we're ahead of the game. So for um, people aged 18 to 25, we have a, um, from January, a first episode rapid early intervention eating disorder service, um, better referred to as FREED, F-R-E-E-D. Um, so that's um, provided from um, within our trust based on a, a model um, developed in London. Um, and again, as, as it said on um, the radio this morning, it, it's so important for early intervention um, in, in, in many conditions, but not least in people with eating disorders. It can become um, a very disabling long term condition um, and the ability to, to get in early. Um, I think will have a really positive impact on um, young people's lives. Um, so it's really great to be able to um, just um, mention that. Um, and then a, a couple of um, last but not least things. So within um, the year, we've had confirmed that um, for once, mental health services particularly have, have received considerable additional funding that the national team and the, um, the national clinical director Claire Murdoch has been a, an advocate for. So there's been very significant additional funding for, for very many different things in the mental health arena um, that's long overdue and begins to get us to some better parity with physical health care services. One of those Examples of that is that um, we've got new crisis sanctuaries um, being um, available to provide mental health support across Nottingham. Um, so these are going to be um, open on um, particular days of the week where people who have um, concerns, worries um, about their mental health and wellbeing could drop in for support. The other important part to mention about this is it's a, another example of collaboration because we're working with um, Nottingham Mind, Turning Point, Framework and Harmless to support and run these sanctuaries 
Um, and again, I think that's something that we're going to see much more of in the coming years, how we can work with um, community and voluntary sector, other charities to help support each other to um, make access to these sorts of services um, much easier for people. And then finally, to, to note, um, for those that are as old as me, uh, maybe fans of Spandau Ballet, um, Roman Kemp, who is the son of one of the founders of said band, did an amazing documentary um, about male suicide, um, Our Silent Emergency, which was aired on Eve, I think, um, showcased our street triage team um, and the brilliant work that they're doing, um, helping people at a very early part of their um, presentation. Um, it was, and if you've not seen it, I don't know if it's available on catch up, but it is, it's a really sort of um, both heartwarming, but also um, poignant documentary that was brilliantly made, um, but showcased our services, providing fantastic um, input for people. So um, I just want to finish by um, running through um, some of the amazing achievements that teams and individuals have, have done in the last 12 months. Um, I'd like to say it's an exhaustive list and I hope we've not missed anybody off, but it's a long list. Um, and one of my ambitions for next year is for it to be even longer because as I said at the start, we've got some fantastic individuals we've got some brilliant teams and um, doing some extraordinary work and it's really important as a trust we recognize that we've got our own internal um, positive stars and other award um, recognition programs but um, for people to be um, shortlisted into finals and winning um, national awards is is um, it's a fantastic achievement and really important that um, we continue to support and encourage people to put themselves forward. So, um, I'm just aware of time, so I'm not going to, um, to go through all the detail, but for example, our end of life together was shortlisted for a health service journal safety award. Um, and this is um, end of life care working with Sherwood Forest and hospices in the locality. Um, uh, I'll mention H HSJ a couple of times for those people that are not aware of it. It's probably um, the most prestigious um, national journey, national journal in relation to healthcare, and their awards are um, seen in a, in a in a really positive light. That if you if you get um, even shortlisted for an HSJ award, they're very popular. Um, you've done really well. Um, our um, Healthy Family Team Service received a gold award for a baby being a baby friendly team. And this is an award, uh, again, very prestigious award that's provided by UNICEF. Um, we had a winner and a number of people shortlisted for um, the Nursing Times Awards. Um, so Sarah Atkinson, who is a Lynn Disability Primary Care Liaison Nurse, um, won an award um, highlighting the issues of domestic violence. We had other people that were shortlisted um, again, which is an achievement in itself. So Holly Atkinson, Fiona Lamb from the Community Forensic Intellectual Development and Disability Team. We had Sally Robbins Cherry, who is a nurse consultant in the Transgender Healthcare Team. Um, she was a finalist in the Nurse Leader of the Year category. Um, our amazing uh, mental health support teams who work in the Children and Young People's um, Directorate were shortlisted um, in, the ch in the Children's Services category. Um, just want a, a quick um, thumbs up for the mental health support teams in schools. Had a, did a visit with them when we hosted um, one of the ministers from the Department for Education a couple of months ago. The work they're doing um, into schools, supporting both schools and the whole school, families, children, uh, again, intervening early and making a massive difference. And again, 
Nottinghamshire is at the forefront of this rollout nationally and it, it's a it's a brilliant um, area for us to be involved in. Um, we've been highly commended in the LDL NDL community awards um, in relation to work that we're doing on electronic observations um, so particularly Rampton Wathwood hospitals um, already done over 8 million electronic observations um, and NDL is a company that does um, software support for those sorts of things. We had a par um, parliamentary award nomination, um, um, our children's community respiratory physiotherapy including rapid response team um, was um, announced as a regional champion. Our oral health promotion team won at the National Dental Awards. Um, amazing um, for such a small team to be winning national awards, doing brilliant preventative work um, um, for, um, for people within the county. Um, we've been a finalist in the Health Service Journal Award, Awards for work with veterans, again in partnership with a, um, a charity called Care After Cam Combat and Project Nova. Um, we've been shortlisted for three other HSJ value awards. Um, and then finally, um, we've had um, psychologists win National Institute for Health Research Awards. The NAIHR, again, is a very prestigious national research organisation. And um, we've had uh, Dr. Sam Mallins and Dr. Irene Konsu um, were offered one year funded awards for their work in cancer and stroke care. So tremendous well done to everybody on that list. Um, again, testament to the amazing work that's going on across the organisation. Um, so uh, to finish, um, before I hand over to the next um, piece, again, a huge, huge thank you from me to everybody that's um, that's kept um, the ship afloat over the last 12 months. It's been um, a, a long, hard slog. I know there's still lots to do. Um, I think overall the trust is in um, a really strong position and, I, and that's a testament to, to everybody's commitment um, to doing such a good job. Um, so that's me done. Thanks very much. I'm now going to hand over to the live performance. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name's Carl. I'm a patient at Wofford. Uh, I've wrote a song about therapy. It's called Candle. <laughs> Neath the surface, this my face, a scream that haunted me every day. Make your choices, love or hate. I can see clearly, fades away. As I rise above, I can see your light shining through. Words that you speak, I know that they must be true. And as I rise above the pain that I am going through, your light is all I need when I don't know what to do. Now I understand the way I was and now I am. Show me hope in my darkest days. And now I see 
of everything has come to be that the candle burning bright it never fades As I rise above, I can see your light shining through you. Words that you speak, I know that they must be true. And as I rise above the pain that I am going through, your light is all I need when I don't know what to do. I've been here before, a room, two chairs and a door. I picked myself up off the floor and we talked until time was no more. As I rise above, I can see your light shining through. The words that you speak, I know that they must be true. And as I rise above the pain that I am going through, the light is all I need when I don't know what to do. I've been here before, a room, two chairs and a door. I picked myself up off the floor and we talked until time was no more. I just want to thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> Carl, it's so, so lovely to hear from you. And um, I'm a massive, massive music fan. I think it is uh, such a way into sharing emotions, sharing stories. Um, it's an absolute privilege to hear you. And thank you so much for that contribution. Oh, thank you. Re really, really lovely and really moving. Thank, uh, you. thank you. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move um, uh, pace a little bit now because I, I have to shift into a bit of a different space after that. Thank you. Um, just to just to acknowledge, thank you. Hearing about so many great highlights from the year, um, and also being able to see and hear um, just some of what has been created in the midst of such difficult times. Um, so a big thank you to all of you who've allowed us to showcase um, your art, um, your poetry, and your song uh, there as well, Carl. It's just it's just really, really great. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, see those again or in more detail, um, there is an online gallery that is gonna be live on the Trust website too. Um, one of the formal things that we need to do as uh, as part of our AGM AMM is just to uh, seek out and respond to any questions from staff or public. And obviously, because of the virtual nature of this, uh, we've we've sought these out in advance. And um, we've had, I think, three questions that I just want to take us through, um, if I can, please, so that we've done that in the public domain. <clears throat> So the first question was from Paul Parslows, one of our community psychiatric nurses. Uh, COVID-19 has clearly impacted sig significantly on the NHS in all departments. What are the plans moving forward for community workers protecting ourselves with continued use of PPE and working from home? And thanks for the question, Paul. Um, and uh, I've got an answer that's been provided by Anne-Maria Newham, our Executive Director of Nursing, AHPs and Qualities. Uh, for the NHS, there is currently no change to our guidelines, so staff should continue to adhere to PPE guidance and the hands, face, space, fresh air message. Um, please also remember the importance of having the COVID-19 vaccine and to encourage others to do so if they haven't already. Uh, the vaccine is clearly a big part of our way out of the pandemic and the best way for you to protect your family and friends. And Paul, just to assure you that as and when that guidance changes, we will make sure staff are made aware. Um, but as a, as a trust, we uh, take a more cautious route. We will wait for the clear guidance uh, and uh, uh, hope that you're able to continue working with us on that. 
The second question um, was, how is the vaccination programme going across Nottinghamshire? And um, a, a response I could give to that is that I know from talking with lots of colleagues across our whole system across Nottingham and Nottinghamshire that the vaccine programme is going really, really well. Uh, figures up to the 11th of July show that in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, uh, over 1.2 million vaccinations have been administered and um, just over 500,000 of those have been second doses. Um, I'm really proud of this work because in part because it's been led by our trust. There are some pockets of lower vaccine take up, particularly in the city uh, and also in some other areas of Nottinghamshire. And we've adapted some innovative approaches to tackle this. And this has included our vaccine bus, which has been visiting areas with lower take up of the vaccine, uh, as well as places with high footfall, like the Victoria Embankment last weekend. And more recently, we've launched a digital campaign targeted at young people on YouTube, Snapchat and Instagram. We've also been able to work with local authority colleagues in tracking some of the equality and demographic data on poor take up, which has been able to help us in how we target and make sure that we're reaching communities where there may be uh, lower take up than in others. And absolutely <clears throat> to reinforce that if you or someone you know hasn't had their vaccines yet, um, you can book an appointment and indeed many of our community vaccination centres are now offering walk-in services too. So the third question that we received was how can we as an organisation make the most of the opportunities and respond to the demands of a changing health and care system? And uh, John, I, I'll invite you to give a response to that, please. John. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, so it's a, it's a really good question and um, I'll, I'll give a sort of summarised answer, really, because um, you, you can imagine you could we could probably write an essay on it really but um i think the, the emphasis is on um the opportunities that are ahead and um i sort of mentioned in my um presentation that working as a system has so many obvious benefits um compared to working in what we call organizational silos where you come and get a, an episode of care you get discharged back and to another organization and so it begins again you know many people um have um requirements across um, different organizations uh, and it's difficult to to navigate it so the important question is so okay so that's fine but what what, what does it mean for us um for not healthcare um one of the things that i think is um is going to be really helpful is for everybody to be thinking of how we can develop our professional working relationships with colleagues across different sectors. So it, I, I would see it as a, as a, a permissive um, framework to work in that if, if within the teams that you work with, you think, for example, that you could do things differently or better, by talking to people in primary care or in the local authority or in um, Nottingham University Acute Trust, um, we can now work within the new framework to enable those things to happen much more smoothly. So we're, we're getting to a point where, whilst obviously this um, Notts Healthcare badge is 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 really important and you know hopefully makes us proud to wear it in the future um we're going to be thinking of a, a nottingham shear badge and um, because we're all working um for the ics and that's going to be some years ahead but I, i'd emphasize the opportunity that that provides us um to improve the quality of what we do and to improve the outcomes for people that use all our services. And um, we need to remember that from an organisational perspective, um, the people that we we serve um, use many other organisations too. Um, and, and as a board and as a trust, we need to think about how we can best enable that to happen through our strategy and through our planning, 
to the use of the resources we have, you know, over half a billion pounds, um, and the 9,000 plus staff and volunteers that can affect that. So it's a big task ahead, and um, you know, as ever with um, significant change like this, as well as the opportunities, there's lots of uncertainty. So the other thing that we, we, we've got to help and support um, all our teams navigate this because um, I, I, I sort of mentioned that we're in that sort of grey area at the minute where these things are coming to fruition, but in the coming months it's it's it's, it's going to be a bit uncertain and we, we need to support people through that so that we can get to a, um, a place that we want to be in the next year or so. So that that's the sort of my sort of brief overview of it, Paula. Um, could go on, but I'm, I'm aware of time. Thank you. Thank, thanks, John. And uh, I think if nothing else, it gives a bit of an insight into um, the uh, how changing this landscape will continue to be over the year ahead. And as you say, the more that we can do um, not only to be part of that, but to be playing in really positively and influencing is going to be important. So we're starting to get to the end of uh, this annual general meeting and annual members meeting. Uh, there's just a few bits that I wanted to say in conclusion. Um, first off, to, to thank everybody who has joined us, uh, whether that is uh, live with the event or indeed after the event on, on catch up. Um, we would really like to hear from you about what you've thought of today's event. Um, so uh, please take time to complete the short evaluation form um, that will be uh, referred to uh, at the end. Um, and you know, I've said previously, said at the start that I very much hope that we will be able to do this in um, it, uh, together next year. We'll see how the year plays out. Um, just to reiterate, thanks to everybody who's contributed to this event, um, both our on-screen presenters uh, and also um, our team behind the scenes uh, who uh, are continuing to be so great at managing the technical elements of this. And uh, a special thanks again to Carl, um, to our poet staff and to all our wonderful patients and staff artists as well. Um, it's, it's been really, really good just being able to showcase just a little of that creativity. And um, a big massive thank you to all of our dedicated staff and volunteers, as John has said, um, for all your incredible work uh, through this year uh, um, and your commitment to providing the very best of care for those who need our services, as well as to their families and carers. Um, I do hope that this AGM AMM has given you some insight into how much the Trust has achieved despite the understandable impacts of the pandemic. And I'd like to thank our communities and our many partners who've supported us and continue to support us as we look into the year ahead. I know COVID-19 has brought challenges um, locally, regionally, throughout the country, across the world. And for many, um, it's been brought a great deal of pain and suffering. And I'm sure every one of us has been impacted in some way by this dreadful virus. And many of us will have close friends and family who have suffered or are still suffering in the midst of all of this. And our thoughts go out especially to those who have lost loved ones um, uh, in this last year. There have also been many examples of human kindness and community spirit. And I hope we're able to hold on to these and to grow this renewed sense of belonging. And on behalf of the Board of Directors of Nottinghamshire Healthcare, I can assure you that we will be retaining our shared purpose and our drive to do all that we can to enable the Trust to provide the very best services for those who need them and also to be the very best employer for those who provide services. So on that note, I'll say thank you and formally conclude this year's AGM AMM and I hope to see you in person next year. Thank you.